Good morning, everyone in the United States that we're moving into good afternoon on the East Coast. Uh, and good evening to everyone uh, tuning in from Europe, Middle East, South Asia, or wherever you are. I am Lalita Duperon. I'm the Associate Director in the Stanford Center for South Asia, and it's my honor to uh, welcome you today to our Arts and Justice webinar. Uh, I want to start with an acknowledgement that Stanford sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Mawekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to honor and make visible the university's relationship to indigenous peoples. The Center for South Asia Art and Justice webinar series is generously supported by a Kohler grant from Stanford Global Studies and co-sponsored by the Stanford Center for Human Rights and International Justice at the University of California, Berkeley Institute for South Asian Studies. The series builds on the success of the Arts and Justice series of the Stanford Arts Institute, which has focused on carceral justice and race-based violence within the United States. The Center for South Asia webinar series has opened up a space to interrogate parallels of injustice in South Asia. How does the state condone, facilitate and encourage religion, class and caste-based carceral violence? And what is the role of the arts in visibilizing this violence? These are some of the questions we have aimed to address in the course of the series and our speakers will be addressing today. The series will continue into our spring quarter when we also have many other lectures. So please sign up for our mailing list and also follow us on social media to receive further information. I have a few uh, housekeeping items. The chat is open. So you may leave comments for the speakers there. Uh, please be polite and constructive. We will not tolerate hate speech of any sort. If you have questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A function of Zoom. So use the Q&A for questions to the panelists. Um, you may do this at any time. We will almost certainly not have time to get to everyone's questions, so I apologize in advance, but we will make sure that all questions will go to all the panelists after the event. The webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded in due course. Please do not record any part of the presentations yourself. Thank you. Now I am delighted to introduce my friend and colleague Aziz Sohail, who will be moderating today's event. Aziz is an art curator, writer and researcher whose work is focused on building interdisciplinary connections and supporting new cultural and pedagogical infrastructures. Since 2020, with the many headed Hydra, he has been co leading a language whose yesterday and tomorrow are the same word. Kal, a trans oceanic platform supporting practices enacting queer pasts and futures and decolonial ecologies. His current research is a meditation on the long durée intersections of sexuality and colonialism with migration, law and identity through the work of practitioners who navigate empire and its afterlives. He has been part of multiple residencies, including at Koj in New Delhi and the Nepal Picture Library in 2019. He has worked with organizations such as the British Council and the Lahore Biennale Foundation to build new cultural initiatives and spaces in Pakistan. As a South Asia Fellow at Cornell University in 2017, he began a long-term project building an archive of cultural and visual production in Karachi from the 1990s through today, which led to an exhibition symposium at the Sharjah Art Foundation in 2019. He is currently an MFA candidate in curatorial and critical studies at UC Irvine, supported by the Asian Cultural Council. Aziz, welcome and over to you. Um, thank you so much, um, Lalita, for this introduction. And also, actually, thank you for the invitation to organize and put together this event. Um, I'm very delighted and I'm honored to be here today with our speakers who I have long admired and cited. And I still can't believe that they all kind of agreed to be here um, in conversation. And that is, has, is truly an honor and it, uh, to, to make happen. Um, when Stanford first invited me to think through this 
project in fall 2020, I was thinking of the possibilities of collective thinking and making, and also to the work of Trinti Minha um, and her invitation to speak nearby. Minha's challenge to us is to embody, as she notes, a form of speaking that does not objectify, does not point to an object as if it is from distant from the speaking subject or absent from the speaking place. A speaking that reflects on itself and can come very close to a subject without however seizing or claiming it. This for me is the spirit of today's conversation. Given the deep and thoughtful work the speakers today have been doing for many, many years in researching and writing the complex histories of South Asia. Um, in the spirit of that invitation from Trinity Minha, the run of the event today will have Athar, Naeem, and Urvashi uh, in this order, each present for about 20 minutes, after which we will open up for audience discussion. I will introduce all the speakers now so, as, so that we don't break the intimacy of their engagement and can actually just spotlight their work fully. Athar Zia, Dr. Athar Zia, is a political anthropologist, poet, short fiction writer, and columnist. She's an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and Gender Studies at the University of North Colorado. Athar is the author of Resist Resisting Disappearances, Military Occupation and Women's Activism in Kashmir, which won the 2020 Gloria Anzaldua Honorable Mention Award and the 2021 Public Anthropologist Award. She is the co-editor of Can You Hear Kashmiri Women Speak? Resisting Occupation in Kashmir and a Desolation Called Peace. She has published a poetry collection, The Frame, and another collection is forthcoming. In 2013, Athar's ethnographic poetry in Kashmir won an award from the Society for Humanistic Anthropology. She's the founder editor of Kashmir Lit and is a co-founder of Critical Kashmir Studies Collective, an inter interdisciplinary network of scholars working on the Kashmir region. Naim Muhaimian uses films, installations, and essays to research families, borders, and utopias, beginning from Bangladesh's two post-colonial markers, 1947 and 1971, and then radiating outward. He is the author of Midnight's Third Child, for, which is forthcoming, and Prisoners of Shothi Kithihash from 2014. He's an editor of Ch Chittagong Hill Tracks in the Blind Spot of Bangladesh Nationalism and co-editor with Esther Sizaks of Solidarity Must Be Def Defended and with Lorenzo Fusi of System Error, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. Naeem is a Mellon Teaching Fellow at Heyman Center at Columbia University and Senior Fellow at Lunder Institute of American Art at Colby College in Maine. And finally, Urvashi Batalia is a feminist publisher and writer. She's the co-founder of India's first feminist publishing house, Kali for Women, established in 1984, and now the director of Zuban, an imprint of Kali, which was created when Kali closed down in 2003. With a long and close involvement in the women's movement in India and South Asia, Urvashi writes extensively on issues relating to women's rights and feminisms in India. Among her best known publications is the award-winning Oral History of Partition, The Other Side of Silence, Voices from the Partition of India, and the Nikkei Asia, uh, which, won, uh, which won the, uh, the Oral History Book Association Award of two in 2001 and the Nikkei Asia Award for Culture in 2003. She has also edited, amongst others, Partition, the Long Shadow, and Women and the Hindu Right with Danika Sarkar. She lives and works in Delhi. And I know it's so late for you, Urvashi. Um, uh, it's like 10.30 PM there. So thank you so much for joining us on your Wednesday night from Delhi. Um, and so we will now take it from there with Athar starting us off. Thank you so much, Aziz, and thank you, Lalita and uh, Simrit, for bringing us together. I want to start by the acknowledgement of land upon which I stand that belongs to Ute Cheyenne and Lakota people. And with that, uh, I'm going to be reading from my paper, and also there is a presentation that's going to be playing uh, in the background. And um, that's where I begin. Thank you so much. So the paper is titled August in Kashmir. I'm going to be doing. What does the month of August invoke? The twilight of summer, receding watermelon picnics here in the West, the first whispers of fall, or the lazy afternoons savoring mangoes in India, or India's Independence Day, the 15th or Pakistan's the day before, the 14th. 
In Kashmir, August is not a month. Call it an extra season of doom. This is added to many such seasons that have been imposed on Kashmir's geo body by the Indian military occupation. These seasons bring imprisonment, humiliation, killings, fake encounters, rapes, arson, maimings, mass blindness. August is no different, yet bring, brings more suffering. Because India celebrates its freedom this month, and Kashmir feels that intensely. As the month starts winding down in the Kashmiri hotland, streets empty of little boys playing cricket and girls trying to stake a game of their own. People leaving for work are told to return early. Friends forego that cup of garam chai with a long lost toast, a tragedy indeed. The military patrols increase, streets are piled with even more barbed wires. The barriers between close neighbors get bigger. Sharing leftover bakir khanis, the mouth melting pastries becomes impossible, but it hardly matters. People are gearing up for maximum survival. Most weddings, birthdays, or other social events are carefully skirted around the time India commemorates its midnight of freedom. <clears throat> August for Kashmiris means increased unfreedoms. The irrepressible Kashmiris call August 15th a black day. Sorry to stereotype a beautiful color in this manner. I must mention that it is being changed to the day of resistance but it is yet to catch up. Historically, Kashmiris have protested this day with all their might. By the same token, they celebrate August 14th, showing their solidarity with Pakistan. About this, a friend who has a staunch stance on Kashmir being independent says, Pakistan Chazulagan, Pakistan is connected to our life. The affective relation with Pakistan is almost non-negotiable for most Kashmiris, as is their deep hatred for India, which only grows. For the last three decades, August 15th is marked with a hartal in Kashmir. Even though the Indian military occupation leaves no stone unturned in making sure that the mobility is curtailed, people voluntarily boycott going out. Come August 15th, even if many prefer to sit, stay indoors, some Kashmiris who are endearingly called Kal Kharab, the headstrong, the impassioned, will still go out into the streets. They may or may not pelt stones, not all Kashmiris pelt stones. Indian troops will respond uh, with disproportionate force. One or two or more will get killed. It kind of depends. Mind you, these will not be armed combatants, but civilian protesters. It kind of depends. Often branded as overground workers for the Tehreek, the movement for Azadi. Across the valley, there'll be encounters with combatants who may or may not receive press. Depends on the kill. Of late, the bodies of combatants killed in encounters are not handed to the people. For many years, the government of India was trying to ban funerals. And since last year, COVID has provided a ready excuse. As soon as the fighters are killed, the bodies are transported to a remote graveyard in the beautiful Sunmarg, and only a few family members are allowed to attend. <clears throat> the funerals of combatants in Kashmir used to be in enormous gatherings and processions, people rushing to attend the janaza and to get the last glimpse of the martyred mujahid. Some would bring back the soil from the fighter's grave. Some would try to brush their kerchiefs across their faces to store as sacred keepsakes. Even if resistance for the living was forbidden, it researched over the bodies of those killed. Uh, Simrit, can you show the WhatsApp slide, please? <clears throat> August 2019. On August 4th, 2019, uh, my WhatsApp lit with a luminous photograph of the shrine of Hazrat Mir Sayyid Ali Hamadani. Uh, we're supposed to look at this. Uh, that's the one, 15th. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> it was my parents sharing with me their visit to the shrine, which is an enduring symbol of spiritual, political, and cultural independence of Kashmir. That's my mother there. Uh, they were planning to visit the shrine for seven consecutive days, a pledge that devotees often take for their spiritual salvation, but they only made it to day one. 
the photograph became the last contact I had with my parents for the next three months or so. On August 5th, I woke up to a profusion of news, not from Kashmir, not, not from Kashmiris, but about Kashmir. Across the TV channels and the internet, uh, the Indian Home, Home Affairs Minister Amit Shah on repeat was announcing to the world that Kashmir's integration is complete. The word integration sounds benign, but its violence marks each Kashmiri body. When I hear the word uttered, this festering wound breaks open and begins to bleed again. In the weeks prior, rumors had been flying like confused bats. The Indian government had flown in 48,000 more troops, in addition to the 700,000 already occupying Kashmir. <clears throat> the valley was emptied of all non-Kashmiris, including Hindu pilgrims, students, and daily wage laborers. No Kashmiri local knew what was happening, nor did the government confirm. As the region was being tightly sealed off, people stockpiled food and gas and waited for information. Now we can move on to the next slide, Simra. Thank you. But on August 5th, 2019, the chaos became clear. Article 370, the section of Indian constitution that established Kashmir's quasi-autonomy and indigenous rights uh, was being eliminated. Kashmir would be annexed as a part of India under the pretense of consolidating the nation's so-called rightful boundaries. To complete its bloody partition, albeit it's still incomplete. In 1947, when India and Pakistan gained their freedom from the British rule, Kashmir lost its own. Instead, it was caught in the middle and divided up. This set into motion years of regional conflict as well as a popular armed resistance movement, which the government of India has met with a brutal military crackdown. So in August, 2019, the spectacle of power wielded by the Indian state was supercharged with ethno-nationalist and religious zeal. The government detained and arrested local client politicians who had run sham governments for India since 1947. Imprisonments swept up average civilians, resistance leaders, human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, even children. At one point, as statistics go, there was an estimated 13,000 juveniles in detention on suspicion of being protesters. While Kashmir's special status under Article 370 had long been uh, largely symbolic, the region had been subjugated by India for decades. Its removal marked a significant turning point. The last vestiges of Kashmir's territorial sovereignty were gone. Now the threat of settler colonialism direct and brazen, uh, which has loomed over Kashmir since 1947, was becoming a real possibility. Like many Kashmiris in the global diaspora, I desperately wanted to know what was happening back home. Digging through my old phone books and discarded cell phones, I looked for the numbers of forgotten and dead relatives, hoping that maybe one of them would work. Defeated as days passed, I realized it was a futile exercise and there was no possible means of communication. This lasted until late September, early October, after some services were resumed. As for the internet, digital apartheid grew intense with India trumping its own track record. Once during the siege, my sister called me. The local administration had set up telephone booths for people who needed relatives, who needed to uh, contact relatives outside the valley. Even though she had not been able to reach our parents who lived just across the bridge from her house, she said they were mazasmans, enjoying. Tsuroz uh, khosh, she said, meaning you stay happy. She assumed an unusually sing-song voice. We talked all of one minute and 56 seconds before the phone was abruptly cut, most likely handed to the next person in line. Radio silence from home followed me for many weeks after. The pain of a sudden and inadequate call was exacerbated by the humiliation Kashmiris experienced as they waited in long lines to make a connection. It reeked of concentration camps where prisoners had no choice but to seize upon fleeting, unsatisfactory chances to reach the outside world. What does the land think when its people are imprisoned in their homes, when all is made to fall silent? when soldiers descend onto the streets like cockroaches raised on a diet of nuclear bombs and uh, hungry dogs that warn off invaders. 
Does the land pray or does it curse? What, it, what does it whisper to the waterfalls, to its verdant forests, to its barren stretches? Does it wait for the pain of the jackboots to subside or does it harness the silence sitting still on the broken asphalt for immediate deliverance? I imagine my homeland bereft and alone in a black hole. I imagine the land and its people between frenzy and patience, between hope and desperation, between abandon and restraint, between protest and silence, but more so in silence, the kind that India has enforced on the wounded, battered body of a land and its people. I had no way of hope, yet I did not have the luxury to lose it. Uh, so here I present a form of hope, a few extracts from what I titled the worst, journ worst journal of the siege. Uh, these are mostly epigrammatic verses and some short poems that capture the catastrophe of each passing day that followed 5th of August, uh, 2019. The first was actually written after that uh, WhatsApp exchange. 4th of August, when I asked if there will be a war, they replied, did it ever end? And continued their song. 8th of August, our hearts are sinking, but our prayers are rising. Azadi, Azadi, Azadi. 11th August, the heart of Eid is sacrifice. In Kashmir, Eid is every day. 12th of August, don't go out into the street, you will get shot. One can hope the lover of freedom shot back. 13th of August, Eid passed peacefully through checkpoints, razor wires, razor wires, and children that know how to stay still. 15th of August, and this is the day of Indian independence. It's titled August in Kashmir. August in Kashmir is a siege on steroids. India wrapped in saffron, Pakistan awash in green. Kashmir, as always, soaks in blood, red, of its old and young, those being born and those not yet. The second, voice, uh, second poem following this. The partition has become a stone in hand, answering bullets that kill and blind every day in Kashmir. Mothers live to wait for the disappeared. Fathers survive only to bury the killed. All epitaphs read, Azadi, Azadi, Azadi. Poem three. The blood, -soaked the blood soaked rags drying in Delhi and Lahore are fresh in Lal Chok. Here, the slaughterhouse is open. Kashmiri bodies hung on hooks, blinded eyes, tender tongued radical meat branded Azadi is the venison of nations hungry. 20th August. Mother, jails are overflowing with lovers, old and young, wounded and maimed, blinded, blindsided. You may have to offer your home as a prison. 6th of September. Kashmiris say, Balagay Balai, I will die for you. An ancient placeholder for I love you. In love as well as dying for Kashmiri has become a measure of life. Dampuchigamit, our breath is broken in our chest. She says, each gulp is a dagger. We bleed by a thousand cuts. This is 26 September. I'm just making some choices here. I think I'm, uh, how am I doing on time, Aziz? Um, you're good, you can keep on. Yeah, I wouldn't worry. Please go ahead as you see fit. Thank you. Thank you. 20th October, after they barricaded every street, snatched the guns and kitchen knives, we picked poetry. 23rd October, Kashmir speaks with silence, a quiet, Sonic prayerful doom is gathering at its heart. The waves will spread to the seas and cities that fester like sores on dirty rivers. 5th of November, India, jubilant it took, jubilant it took all the keys. 
to locks that have long been discarded in Kashmir. 7th of November, amidst war, snow reminds me we are all lovers first. 12th November is the 100 days of Kashmir siege. That's uh, when first 100 days were completed. So I just marked it with a simple line saying, it's 72 years plus 100 days. So on 14th October, I wrote something that was inspired by Aga Shahid Ali's poem, Postcard from Kashmir, where he is meditating on a postcard that he uh, gets from home. Uh, and that book was published in 1987. Uh, that poem was published in 1987. The poem is titled, No Word from Kashmir. Home shrinks into my palm, a neat rectangle of the iPhone. Google Earth snapshot of Kashmir. Home blurs when I pull it close. I never loved colors. Yet I hold the red blood of the green jellum in my hand. This is home. Is this the closest I'll ever be to home? Will the siege ever end? When I return, will all colors still be blood red? The jalam forever khaki. My desire so overexposed, incomplete prayers, stones everywhere, and my memory sagging. With names I must keep chanting, slogans I must keep raising. I count the days of the siege, listening to the silence from Kashmir grow as big as a heart, beholding love, only love. 8th December, there were some other things happening in India. Uh, so it kind of brought forth a different kind of, uh, you know, just highlighting some things in a broader sense. First, they came for the most, they came for the Kashmiri Muslims, you stayed silent. They came for the Sikhs, you stayed silent. They came for Indian Muslims, you stayed silent. They came for the Dalits, you stayed silent. They came for the Christians, you stayed silent. They came for the LGBTQ plus communities, you, say, you stayed silent. They came for their women, you stayed silent. They came for your women, you stayed silent. I will not threaten that anyone is coming for you and hence you should act. The threat to survival is not the only thing that should rouse you. It is the love for the heart beating next to you that should make you act. If that doesn't rouse you, keep sitting. That is punishment enough. We will conquer this our way. 29th December, she sends across a message from Kashmir, happy it rains. Sad, her best friend died. Oof. Kese, my mind a mess. Pellets, bullets, beating, mowed under an army jeep. No, a heart attack, she replies. Thank God. So these are the last two poems, 30th December. They're both titled Love in Kashmir. She returned home to broken gutters, spilling on doorsteps, bullet casings, old bones. She had kept the roses from the garden gutted by grenades. Winter had raised the rest. She never bid him goodbye. Her eyes were red from the tear gas. In Kashmir, lovers are suspected of seeking azadi. It's 30th December. And then 1st January 2020, which is the one, uh, 151, the uh, day of Kashmir siege. Don't bring any spice for our last dinner together. I'll bring the only candle, some sun-dried tomatoes, that a neighbor shared, warmed in the borrowed mustard oil, you bring such war. If at all the baker in your alley opens today, don't bring any spice. My city is laden with pepper tonight. Don't bring any spice for a last dinner together. If you crave salt, we have tears. Thank you. Thank you so much, Athar, for that incredibly powerful and moving, um, the, the words that you just said. I mean, I, it was just so, 
I mean, poignant. And thank you so much for bringing them to us in this space. Um, and then Naeem, over to you. Um, Thank you, Aziz, and thank you for um, inviting all of us, getting the chance to be in this event with Arthur and Rupesh and all of you. Um, it's a great opportunity. Thank you. This title is a variation of the subtitle of the first volume of Art Spiegelman's Holocaust memoir. His original volume is called Maus Part One, My Father Bleeds History, published in 1980. The Our Families version here refers to a belief that family stories as proxy biographies of nation can be prevalent, but that the blockage of a proliferation of this form comes from an apparatus that insists that only biographies that enhance the stability of the state deserves expression. My paternal grandfather, Moluvi Amdad Ali, was encouraged to study mathematics by a British officer because the colonial administration had set a Muslim quota in the civil service after the 1905 partition of Bengal. Ali took Sanskrit as a second course. And when he went on stage at his Kolkata school to receive a gold medal in that subject, associated with Hindu holy scriptures, a teacher is supposed to have whispered, it must be a mistake. It's a Muslim boy. A math wizard and famously intolerant of any child of his who wasn't good at math. I remember doing the math problems from Jadubir Patigonit and being terrified of getting a problem wrong in front of him. In the end, about a third of the children went into the sciences under his influence. Electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, surgery, physics, English, and medicine. Entering the civil service, he had to keep relocating. And so my father was born in Maiman Singh in East Bengal, or what later became East Pakistan and then Bangladesh. While his younger sister was born in West Bengal, Diamond Harbor, what is today inside India. My mother was born in Assam to the Islamic historian Soyad Murtazali, but she soon had to move to Silet when the province was divided in 1947. Ali had been writing a short compendium of place names of his province. He now had to truncate the name to place name histories of Silet. Eventually, both sides of my family flowed toward East Bengal, which had become East Pakistan after 1947. The exception was my grandfather's younger brother, the novelist Sayyid Mustafa Ali. He wrote an essay demanding that Pakistan keep the language of East Pakistan as Bengali against the political project to impose the more Islamic Urdu as the only official language of Pakistan. The new Pakistan government was tremendously irritated. And so Ali relocated to West Bengal, which was now inside India. In any case, all his intellectual circles were still in West Bengal. And as one of the few Muslim writers in that milieu, he had higher respect there. In a humorous short story about Italian immigration written around this time, he wrote, after all these experiences, you think to yourself, well, Indian and Pakistani officers are relatively new to this game of border crossing. They harass the passenger for no reason. In Europe, the customs offices must be there only for the amusement of the tourists. In 1965, India and Pakistan went to war. And my father, as a doctor in the military, had to perform surgery near the war front. He needed a Pakistan military ID, and then finally a Pakistani passport in 1970, when he went to England to study surgery. Returning to Pakistan in 1971, he encountered a nation transformed. The long showdown over the 1970 election results had begun and people were spitting at Pakistani soldiers on the streets of Dhaka. When war broke out, the end of Pakistan was inevitable. Younger cousins were thrilled and joined the war while my grandfather retreated into his study and tried to catch the BBC on the radio. 
he had voted for the Nationalist Party that won a landslide victory. Everyone had voted for them, but he seemed unprepared for the end of the Pakistan of his dreams. The 1971 war ended when India intervened and a surrender document was signed between General Niazi of Pakistan and General Arora of India. They were both from Punjab province, also bifurcated in 1947 and were classmates at Quetta Staff College from British colonial period. This was a strange reunion. My parents had to wait another two years to become Bangladeshi because my father had the misfortune to be posted to West Pakistan just as the war broke out. Stranded inside what had now become enemy lines, he, along with thousands of other stranded Bengali officers were registered as POWs, prisoner of war, without having been near the battlefield. My mother and I were collateral prisoners along with many other families. In 1973, all the prisoners were finally sent back as part of the Simla Peace Accord. Fokker friendship planes sent by the German Red Cross waited for us. And as we drove to the airport, my mother could not stop vomiting over the side of the car. Sometimes I hallucinate that it was the spirit of Pakistan leaving her body. It was some kind of homecoming. In a new country, nothing seemed settled and new resentments were in the air. Inside the new Bangladesh army, those who fought in the war received double promotion, but people who were returned from Pakistan prison camp were called repatriates as a slur and they had to for salute their former juniors. Suddenly there were too many lieutenants, captains and majors inside this new army. By 1975, as tensions grew, some army officers started getting posted overseas. Six months before the brutality of 1975, my father was among many sent to work as doctors in Libya. While there, we received news of the murder of the president and his family. Later, as counter coups came, some of these assassins found refuge in Libya. Gaddafi's capacious heart took in, without differentiation, Palestinian guerrillas, Bangladeshi killers, and Japanese Red Army hijackers. The Bangladeshi community in Tripoli was divided. We had left turbulence, but the troubles had followed us. Socialist Republic Libya became an international pariah and green pass books were introduced for rations. My mother rolled her eyes as the ration books were given out. We had seen these in Pakistan and Bangladesh, but Libya was supposed to be oil rich. Why else did we tolerate miskeen slurs on the streets of Tripoli? My father declined to renew another four-year contract and on our way home, he used some of his savings to buy one of the first VCR players. It was a Betamax and became obsolete six months later. We were as good at prognosticating technology as history. Back in Bangladesh, there was an odd calm and white paint at the root of trees. A military man was now president. He wore dark sunglasses, exhorted the nation to dig ditches, and opened a Shishu Park or Children's Park. He began fighting with India over Talpotti or New Moor, a tiny island that would often sink at high tide. There may be oil underneath, or so we heard. Anyway, fighting India united people now. The 1971 special relationship had soured. When I began to probe into 1971 war history after college, family members were hesitant. My mother said, as she often does, ki dorkar, what is the need? Worried that I would not write the shothik itihash or correct history, an uncle who was a physics teacher wanted to make sure I understood what undivided British India was for him. He woke up one morning in 1947 to find many Hindu teachers had crossed the border and he got double promotion to become the new headmaster of the school. From him came a torrent of stories, grievances from a time before Pakistan. 
these stories were of personal slights received from Bengali Hindus. But over the years, I have heard variations from many others. The separate dishes and the breaking of a glass after you drank from it, school humiliation about smelling of onions and the way sisters braided your hair, and of course, my grandfather's Sanskrit gold medal story, which by now I could recite from memory. The trouble is younger family members could recite an identical set of stories with Urdu, Biharis, Marwaris, and Poshchimas as villains. For at least a few years, Poshchima meant dreaded West Pakistan, not a Euro-American West. In 1947, we roughly stayed where we were, except my mother from Assam and my aunt from Diamond Harbor. It is neighbors who left, and the family makes a point to state that we never tried to profit from distressed sale of Hindu lands. 1971, though, was an event of different enormity. There was no staying or waiting. In the same family, everyone had different experiences. From my Marxist cousin, who later studied in Moscow, fleeing the house to join the rebels, narrowly evading capture by the Pakistan army, to the physics professor with resentful memories of Hindu Bengalis before 1947. He stayed in his university job, and after the war, found himself on an enemy's list. I didn't hear any from other people. There was no communication for a long, long time. And otherwise, also, as I said, the, the ease of communication which is available nowadays, it was not all that. And the way these people behaved with us in the later period, it didn't give a congenial feeling of separation at the time of separation. Hmm. So, obviously, it did not keep any contact with each other, but we would like uh, have been hearing about uh, people's what they were doing, etc. Johan, Amra Bangladesh, Firigalam Pori. So that. anyway, during that period, till the March of next year, seventy one, we had no idea what was happening or what was in the planning stage. Kintu emnite dhakai kiyo chhishar khobar to patchilen. Uh, whatever has been reported by Radio Bangladesh, or Radio Pakistan rather, mm. I would say. Mm. And uh, again, I must tell you that we were not all that EA about hearing to BBC or Voice of America or Radio Australia. These were the t three different radio which were available for hearing. Mm. Because shortwave radio was not all that common and not, though I had a radio like that, but uh, uh, news in those days uh, I used to work really very hard. So I was talking about it, but I didn't know about it. But I didn't know about it. Actually, I didn't know about it. I didn't 7th March is a declaration holo. Even Tarputika onward, all the things which are growing, they only started English. coming in the uh, various news media. Jitami Bulam Jay, BBC, hmm. Voice of America, Radio Australia. In the Emirate of West Pakistan, you have a colleague, huh? You are a kid, you are a kid, you are a kid. They did not want what they knew. Amadir Janavajan. Obvious reason. Tara Amadaki 
অন্ধকারে রাখার চেষ্টা করত তখন জানা শুরু করলাম যে কি ধরনের তাও ডিটেলে না বিকজ যারা ডিটেলে জানতো তারা বোধ তখন আর জীবিত ছিল না साधारण In 2010, my father needed a heart bypass surgery. And since then he needed more surgeries over the last decade. The final surgeries were complicated. So I decided to take him to India. It was a bitter pill to swallow for him because his whole life he had criticized Bangladeshis who go abroad for medical treatment. For the fourth procedure, we hit a roadblock. For the first time, the Indian embassy in Dhaka denied his medical visa. The visa form was now upgraded to an electronic submission. So you could no longer leave certain fields empty. For the question that asked whether he or a parent had ever held a Pakistani passport, he answered honestly, yes. That was the grounds for denial, a stringent code that sharpened each time there was a border clash over Kashmir or dead terrorists with Pakistani passports conveniently in their pockets. I recently found out that a friend was now working at the Indian embassy and told father, we may have an inside track to get that visa now but he declined to apply again, saying to me, or in English, let it go. No need for so much pain to go to India. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naeem, um, for this powerful, sort of journey through your own family's complex and ever-shifting history, which I think so many share um, in South Asian contexts in different ways. Um, and Urvashi, if, if I can just ask, hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Aziz. Um, thank you, Lalita Simar, for organizing this wonderful panel. And it's been so moving and uh, lovely to listen to Atar and to listen to Naeem. Um, I'm also, Naeem, terribly jealous, actually, of both your presentations and the effortless ease with which you combine words and pictures. I simply don't think visually. And uh, so all I have really uh, are the words. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I also want to tell you, Aziz, I had a bit of a heart attack a, a few minutes back when Naeem was halfway through his presentation. The electricity went, I suddenly lost the internet and uh, for the electricity to go at nearly midnight is quite unusual. Um, but my internet connection usually jumps to that of my brothers who lives upstairs and who's on a different electrical system but he goes to sleep at 11 and he switches off his internet. So I was desperately calling him, but luckily he hadn't switched it off. Now, this is all this is to say that if I suddenly, uh, if you see me freeze, it'll mean that the electricity is gone again and I will reconnect on my phone. I think just to say that. So um, I'm going to start, as I said, that um, basically I'm going to talk, uh, it's my, um, thing is to just use words. So I want to tell you a few stories. Um, my stories begin uh, from last year. During the protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act in uh, different parts of it, Delhi, where I live in, say, Shaheen Bagh, which is the best known, but in Hosrani, in Zakir Bagh, and other places in Delhi, everywhere it was women who sat in protest. And everywhere that women sat for long periods of time, stories floated around all over the place. At one such meeting on a cold winter night, a friend of mine and I sat in a small group 
at one side of the large Shaheen Bagh protest. She had brought along a box of sweet gajak, a winter delicacy. And we, as we passed it round, the women shared it and swapped more stories. At some point, it was my turn to tell a story. So here is the story that I told them. A few years ago, I was at a literature festival in Karachi and I have told this story a few times before, so I apologize if you've heard it before. At this literature festival, I met a woman called Shehnaz. I heard her story, but it was difficult to hear it properly in the clamor of the festival. And I asked if I could come to her home and talk to her. And the next day I went along and listened to the story. Shehnaz's original name was Guru Bachchan. At the time of partition, she was about 16 or so. And while fleeing with a large group of people, including her family, neighbors, and others to what they hoped was safety, they were, like many such groups, attacked. She was abducted, as were five or six of her young friends of roughly the same age. Later, as happened with many women, it is believed that her abductor and she married. I say it is believed um, because she didn't, when she was telling me the story, put it in quite um, these kind of words, but everybody around her did so. And when she married him, she converted to Islam and became Shahnaz. Together, they had five children and they were living their life in Pakistan. And in the early 60s, they learned through a visitor that her parents were still alive in India, that they had actually escaped that attack. The husband then suggested that they visit the parents and she meet them again. And the entire family came because visas were a bit easier at that time and they took advantage of this. There was a reunion and much joy but difficulties arose when Shahnaz was to return. Her parents refused to let her go back. They said that the husband could go, but she had to stay. They would not let her go with a Muslim man. And they suggested that she could keep her children if she liked. But Shahnaz's husband refused to leave the children behind. And he went to Pakistan while she stayed on in India. Her parents now reconverted her back to Gurbachan. In Pakistan, Shahnaz's husband remarried. His wife brought up his five children. In India, Gurbachan was married to a local man who had a young son, and she looked after him and lost touch with her other children. After her Indian husband died, she moved to the US with her son, and there he and she together tried to locate the family. 50 years had passed by now. They put an advertisement in a Pakistani paper and after a couple of tries, her family surprisingly, miraculously saw the advertisement and came forward to claim her. When I met her, she had come to Pakistan to meet her children. As I said, it had been 50 years since she had last seen them and she had decided that this was where she wanted to stay. This was her home and her family and she had chosen to become Shehnaz again. Would her dream of staying on for her children's sake be realized? Would the Pakistani state grant her citizenship on the basis of compassion? Does such a thing as a compassionate state even exist? It was hard to say. Citizenship is so often understood only in the arid language of law that this kind of thing does not even enter that discourse. That evening at Shaheen Bagh, Shahnaz's story enabled us to begin talking about the question of citizenship in a different way. And to look at things like a sense of belonging, like love, like the idea of home and so much more. It also enabled us to connect with a history recently lived, perhaps even by some of the women who were there and are recently profoundly present in the discussion at the time. In a way, it made everything that was happening around us real, connecting a little known past so intimately to what was happening in the lives of these women at the time. Earlier this year, when the farmers protests in Delhi began, and as more and more women from Punjab and Haryana, two states that were deeply impacted by the partition, came out to join the protest, stories again made their presence felt in different ways, 
some translating into songs and poems speaking about women of the region, others into stunning posters created by women young and old. And when Bilkis Dadi, the 82 year old activist from Shaheen Bagh, went to declare her solidarity with the farmers, I wondered if she perhaps took some of these stories with her. Perhaps she took Shainaz's story with her to tell to the women farmers. I think one of the things that both Shaheen Bagh, the anti-CA protests which it came to symbolize, and the participation of women farmers in the current protests have done is to open up a space for female bonding. In Shaheen, college students, musical groups, performers went with their stories, their plays, their songs. They festooned the place with their works of art. And the older women who may at other times have been suspicious of them opened their arms wide and welcomed them. Generational borders disappeared. Solidarities were forged across religion, class, caste, gender, and a lot of listening took place. Somewhere for me, this brought together the two key things that have been so important for the women's movement across South Asia, stories and the power of female friendships, stories that demand that we must listen I do believe strongly that the act of listening is also an act of healing. It's an act of respect. And it is in many ways an act of seeking acknowledgement for the loss, the grief, the suffering, and therefore very much an act of seeking justice in the present for those who have gone in the past. Aziz opened this meeting with a mention of Trin Minha's wonderful concept of speaking nearby. I want to suggest that the act of speaking nearby is incomplete without the act of listening deeply. That the speech of the subaltern has no meaning unless it is listened to with respect and depth. But let me go back to what I began to speak about, female friendships, and I want to give you an example of this. My story here has to do with the history of Pakistan and Bangladesh, which Naeem spoke so movingly about through the story of his family. Within the feminist movement, we have over the years painstakingly built solidarities across the South Asian region, working together to create a collective feminist vision, sharing knowledge and indeed sharing our lives. I remember a very amusing incident some years ago when an extremely well-intentioned American scholar managed to secure a fund to come to South Asia. And the idea she had was to organize dialogues between South Asian women who she thought were perhaps warring and distanced feminist factions. She came to find that all of us practically lived in each other's pockets. So someone in India told her, no, no, don't go to Sri Lanka just now. You know, Sunila and Radhika are traveling or they've got their children's um, schooling or something to take care of. Don't go to Pakistan because Farida is not around. And she was really taken aback at this kind of solidarity. However, it's not all romantic and lovely. And I have seen the sisterhood fractured very deeply. And the one time that that has happened is in the context of the separation of Bangladesh from Pakistan. I recall such a situation one day in my home when two close friends of mine looked at each other with hostility because of that history and refused to talk to each other. One of them said to me, I have a visceral reaction looking at her because she's from Pakistan. But later, as we understood more, there were other reactions. And one of the most moving such moments took place in Lahore at a women's conference organized by a group called Asar. On the day that marked the 30th anniversary of the Bangladesh war, Pakistani feminists set aside a whole day during which they shared stories of families divided and united. Women singers came and sang for their Bangladeshi sisters. And in the silence that followed, as all of us held back our tears, the Pakistani feminists came forward and offered their Bangladeshi sisters something that they had been asking, something that Bangladesh has been asking of the Pakistani state, an apology. Something that the state had not and would not do, but something that women did. It was an unforgettable moment deeply for all of us in South Asia. And it was also unforgettable because in the South Asian context, India is so often the dominant uh, 
dominant whatever country because of its size and so on. And this was a moment that was for Pakistan and for Bangladesh and the Indians stood aside. This moment also marks something else that has helped to build South Asian solidarities, female friendship. Once again, not wanting to romanticize this, but in our recent past, these friendships have been really important. Within Sri Lanka in the 25 year, the 25 year old war divided communities, but Tamil, Muslim and Sinhala women cemented their friendships, helped to look after each other's children and fought hard, sometimes not always successfully, to not let the politics of hatred divide them. In 2002, when the Gujarat violence happened in India, South Asian feminists came together to help us put together a report. Somewhere for me, as an activist and a practitioner, this claiming of a shared history and this drawing on our past has been very important. In my own work as a researcher on partition, this has been so valuable to me. But I do want to point out that it's not as easy as I may have made it sound. Our states remain, continue to remain suspicious of each other. They make it extremely difficult for us to work in each other's countries. But this situation too, we must take heart, is not static. For the designs of the states or the intentions of the states can sometimes be defeated by technology. And this is happening very much, for example, these days in the world of art, when young women artists from across South Asia are working together, when young writers are working together to create alternative histories through graphic stories, and when students in Pakistani universities and teachers in Pakistani universities are organizing Zoom lectures with people from India or from Bangladesh or elsewhere, and this is happening in many ways in the reverse direction as well. So I think in our deeply fractured world, this kind of sharing of our pasts, our presents, our dreams of our futures is really all that we have to hold on to. And the hope that at least with this at our level, we will continue to communicate. In our own work as publishers, we've tried very hard to focus on a South Asian solidarity of writing and publishing, ensuring of course that South Asia does not only mean India. So some years ago, we worked on a collaborative research project on sexual violence in South Asia, under which we published a set of books. We wanted this project to be one where researchers from South Asia work together in each other's countries. But of course, we are, there are too many hostilities for that to happen. So in the end, we worked in individual countries, but then we shared the stories across countries. And those stories led to the making of pieces of theater and so on and so forth. And finally, because I've talked so much about stories, I want to end with my, a story which is very personal. It's funny and it's also a little bit sad. It's the story of an artist friend of mine from Pakistan called Lala Rook, who died a couple of years ago. Um, Lala knew she was dying and she was prepared um, for it, but a few years before she died, I think two years, perhaps Lala said to me that, look, I have got a multiple entry visa for India because I'm now a senior citizen and they think we can't do any harm and I want to come. So I said to her, come, and she crossed over at the Amritsar border and I went to meet her. Lala's aim in coming was she wanted, of course, to visit friends, but in Amritsar, she wanted to see the Golden Temple. But when I picked her up, I thought she'd be hungry and I thought that I would take her to a dhaba to eat aluka parathas. And so I kept pointing out dhabas on the way in from um, the Vaga border. And at some point, Lala said to me, shut up. I just want to drink some beer and chill in a restaurant where I can have kebabs and beer. And so we found a place in Amritsar where Lala had her beer and she had her smoke. And then we went and saw the Golden Temple. And then we came away from there to Delhi and um, so on. And in the Golden Temple, one of the things that Lala very much wanted to do was to buy a kirpan and tuck it into her salwar and walk the way Sikh women walked around the sarovar carrying their kirpans like weapons, which she did. And then I had to persuade her to pack it into her suitcase. Otherwise we would be taken off the flight to Delhi. So she did that. That's the funny part of this story or the charming part of it, call it what you like. For those of you who knew Lala, I'm sure you can imagine her doing this. The sad part is that a couple of years later when she was dying, 
We spoke about 15 days before that. And she said to me, can you come? I want to say goodbye to my friends. And I could not go. Try as I might, I could not get a visa. All it would have taken was a visa for 24 hours. I could have gone in the morning. I could have come back in the evening, but that didn't happen. So um, the, uh, I began by talking about a compassionate state. And I want to end by telling you that, um, is, or asking this question, is it too much to hope that there will ever be compassion in the hearts of our states? And finally, finally, uh, because it was International Women's Day two days ago, and because today is the death anniversary day of Savitri Bai Phule, a famous Indian feminist from the mid 19th century, we opened our mornings on the 8th of March with a song from Pakistan, which was a song created by Pakistani feminists for the Aurat March. And I'd like to ask Aziz to play us a snippet of that song to close my remarks on this subject. So Aziz, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Urvashi. And I just want to say that actually I'm just getting shivers from what you said because the first time we actually did meet was at Dala Rook's house in 2015 mm -hmm. in Lahore. Um, where Natasha, Jinwala, and you and Lala and everyone was like in that studio visit. And it's just amazing to kind of think of, I mean, to think of it today in like such a different way. Um, but I will now just share my screen and I am not very good on media. So I'm hoping it's working perfectly. It is. जबर का निजाम गिराने वाले हैं हम एक नया समाज बनाने वाले हैं हम पितर शाही राज गिराने वाले हैं हम एक नया समाज बनाने वाले हैं हम इंतलाब हैं हम इंतलाब हैं हम इंतलाब हैं हम इंतलाब हैं हम किसी की राहीर नहीं इंतलाब हैं हम सुल्म की तस्वीर I'm so much. 
समाज मनाने वाले हैं हम पे फिर शाही राज गिराने वाले हैं हम एक नया समाज बनाने वाले हैं हम इनकलाब हैं हम इनकलाब हैं हम इनकलाब हैं I'm not as eloquent as um, either of our three wonderful speakers, and um, I have. I'm seeing that there are some wonderful questions already coming up, and I would encourage you to start asking them. Um, but if you will offer me a couple of minutes just to make a couple of closing remarks here, um, I'm just going to reshare my screen. Today we appear to be frozen and imprisoned within accelerating fascism, authoritarianism, and inequality only made more visible in this pandemic that has made more possible the specter of a more powerful state that can wield violence and control at will. How is then one to imagine belonging and livability while holding strongly to a queer feminist ethic, entangled as we are in the archive of our complex pasts with its wounds ever ongoing, ever deep, where the states themselves do not reckon with their own excesses, do not pursue justice, do not apologize, do not build imaginative futures. Indeed, of course, the very definition of a nation to which all of us here belong in some way and hold passports off is built on exclusion, leaving so many behind. What then does it mean to be made and destroyed by a nation? What does it mean to not fit in boxes? When I think of the ghostly haunting past, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to do this where it opens up in this way, does it? Simrat, okay. When I think of the ghostly haunting past, I look at the figure of this man named Baba Singh whose arrest record I first found when I had just arrived in Southern California in fall 2018. Baba Singh was arrested for crimes against nature and incarcerated for five years at San Quentin Jail, not very far from Stanford. Baba Singh was leaving an empire on the decline, following in the footsteps of many who were journeying and leaving their lands in search of new fortune, only to be incarcerated in this new rising empire at the time. Baba Singh came to the US when the state itself that we all, that some of us here are living on um, was undergoing rapid juridical shift as part of the migration of him and other Asians and entering this land and in response to it. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act prohibited the immigration of all Chinese laborers and the 1924 Immigration Act would effectively extend this ban to all immigrants from Asia and last through 1965. Indeed, most South Asians in the US would not have actually been possible before 1965. It is now, I guess, much more knowledge that's available to all of us that this, in this land of freedom, the freedom only extends to the white body and is indeed constructed and made possible at the expense of everybody else. This brief knowledge that I have been able to glean of Baba Singh's life serves as an entry for me to continuously think of lives that don't make sense in the nation, national mold those lives that are constantly in a position of duress and how we may work as those on and from the margins to build solidarity and futures. As a Pakistani, I don't actually remember exactly when I discovered that India was the big enemy, but I think it was so inherent to the body politic that it sometimes feels like I was birthed with this knowledge. I have distinct memories of being in fifth grade for the first time of trains moving across the Punjab border of dead bodies. And I remember my mom saying, yes, of course, the Hindus and the Sikhs did it, but this was not the case in the sense that both sides were complicit in this crime and that my grandparents, who were also part of an exodus, may have either benefited or also responded to it. The story of Bangladesh came much later in ninth grade 
when we read of a time in 1969, when we had elections and our side, that is West Pakistan, refused to accept them. And therefore there was a civil war, just noting the language that is used in Pakistan and Bangladesh became, East Pakistan became Bangladesh aided by the enemy India. There was of course, no mention of a genocide. Pakistan to this day has not mentioned this or taught it as such in its history books or made a public apology to this effect. On Bangladesh, Kamran Azdar Ali borrows from the Haitian thinker Truyo and extends his thinking from how Haiti has been considered within Western white epistemological thought to West Pakistan's relationship to then East Pakistan. He says that the liberation of Bangladesh was conceptually incomprehensible as a phenomenon by the elite West Pakistani establishment, its military and its intellectuals. It was an impossibility that became a fact. This non-acknowledgement of our past is based on the way we in West Pakistan thought about the Bengalis in general. At best, there was a condescending attitude towards them, considering ourselves the elder siblings who would teach them civilizing habits." End quote. Bengalis then for the West Pakistanis were a people to master and colonize. In Unthinking Mastery, Julieta Singh eloquently unpacks this pursuit of mastery that has haunted and troubled anti-colonial thinkers. Mastery, of course, was inherent as a vehicle of colonialism, moving from both domination of bodies to intellectual and linguistic mastery in order to bend a people to one's will. Triumphant post-colonial states were born from and of this mastery, replicating the same patriarchal colonial dominations of their masters and thus th therefore suffer from that today. The offerings today to us from these speak thinkers open for us forays into our past, its hauntings into the present, the long partition that still exists within South Asia and the possibilities of coming and moving together beyond the limiting cipher of the nation and the demand it makes of loyalty, of mastery, of belonging. What then are the possibilities to subvert the narratives that we have been continuously taught? How do we build from ruins, both of accelerated and slow violence, embodying indeed the paradox of being and non-being? How do we imagine solidarities from a feminist queer analytic and continue to build alliances across borders even as comrades continue to be jailed and picked up and silenced and made to disappear? As a mere artist and curator, my only solution and possibility is to think of making space, of building, of continuing to build, even as others who would not want this to be built thrive, of making to live, to survive, to imagine, and to at least make some forms of impossible very possible. Thank you, Athar Naim and Urvashi, for making also in your words, your works, and your life some of these possibilities for all of us to nourish and build with and towards. And I do now want to open it up for questions and any discussion with the um, uh, the panelists because you know we have all this time now with them. We have about half an hour, so. And we have three questions already. So perhaps I can just take them away if in no particular order. Um, so Athar Dixitha Deka um, asks, how do you think young scholars working with the memories of enforced di disappearances across conflict zones in India, particularly when justice has not been served yet, make a difference within the confinements of academia? And I feel like this question can be extended to everyone here actually today. So I could just answer it from my vantage. It can be answered in so many different ways. I feel like <clears throat> like thinking about myself as a Kashmiri and uh, having this experience and this li lived experience of having uh, all kinds of grave human rights violations occurring and enforced disappearances are particularly worrisome because the state doesn't uh, agree that it's disappeared anyone and then it's disappearance of a disappearance and then the families, there's no precedence of such a thing happening. You know, if someone is killed, you know, at least you go to the grave and all of that happens. Uh, it kind of follows, there's a ritual, but this disappearances, there's absolutely nothing that happens and rituals have been created around it. So for me, it was more, uh, to me, it was very, very important to talk about them because they also speak to the larger issue that how is it possible that someone can get just disappeared and just disappear and there's no one is going to be held accountable. 
I mean, it's not even a killing, like there's a murder and you don't know who murdered this person, but still there is something happening. There's a dead body and people talk about it, but the disappearances are really, really gruesome. So with an academia, I felt like for myself, as I said, I'm going to answer this from personal vantage. I couldn't really do this kind of work in Kashmir University. I had tried there. And then I also tried it elsewhere, but uh, it didn't work because I was told to uh, do comparative images of things coming out from Kashmir with uh, Palestine or something like that. Uh, but so how, so in that sense, when I thought about Western academia and coming here to do this kind of work, I did think about academic freedoms. And I don't know if you are, are answering it, uh, if you um, are asking this in that manner, but I do feel like uh, within the, when you're saying confine, uh, confinements of academia, uh, you can talk about Kashmir in uh, the US academia and you can work on it as far as you can go. But then thinking about Indian academia, I don't think it's possible in the same manner. Uh, you can work on human rights violations and stuff like that, but I don't know how far they can go. I have had many students reach out to me uh, and many others who, who are actually stuck that they have to title their research in a manner that it doesn't have human rights, but has a lot of peace in it. That's what they have been told by their academics and supervisors who want to help them and who want them to understand Kashmir better in this situation. But they're telling them that, can you change the title a little bit? So they get back to us and they ask us to read their proposals so that we can kind of, you know, just help them uh, chisel that. And, and they do say, several of them came back and said that this can pass if there is peace in it. So I said, you know, everything can pass if there is peace in it, but uh, for those titles. So I, so I think that uh, it's, it's about also, where are you doing this kind of work? Are you doing it in South Asia? Are you doing it in India? And then thinking about US and thinking about the Western academe. So there is some leeway here, but also like it, it's all, it also depends on how far you want to go. Uh, when people work and they work on the front lines and on that uh, in that sense, then there is hardly um, any chance you can go back easily to these places. So there's that threat as well. So working on these, uh, as you say, memories of disappeared. How can you um, where justice can make difference within the confinements of academia, I would go back to Urushi's point of uh, keep talking, keep listening, and as far as you can do it. And uh, not everyone has to be foolhardy. We have to look out for our own safety. And uh, there's only some people who are pushed to that level. So you can create those kind of solidarities where you talk about disappearances. And the problem with disappearances is, in my case, uh, in Kashmir's case, since uh, India has changed the technology of torture, now there are different kinds of tortures happening now. Uh, the punishment is not just disappearances. We actually have many mothers who were activists. They are dying. The senior activists are dying out. Then you have the wives and they're getting older and they're getting aged. And what happens to the movement? What's the future of the movement? And kids, not all kids are kind of anointed in the movement and only some are. But I have seen a lot of kids taking part and trying to take the memory further. So there is a danger in disappearances that, you know, the movement might not work as strongly. So it does fall back, back upon people who can do that kind of work within the confinement or within the academic freedoms. Uh, it just depends on the kind of work you want to do. Urvashi, uh, Naeem, I don't know if you also want to jump in here, have a specific, any response um, as well to, to this specific question. I have a short one, but Urvashi, do you want to go first? No, you go first, it's fine. Um, so a um, few things. One is that I do think that a, uh, regardless of whether the university setting is in South Asia or overseas, um, there's generally a form of working where the time between your research to publication, whether it's in the form of a seminar or an essay or whatever, there's, there's the potential of a long time span, right? And I think uh, for some of these incredibly unresolved uh, situations, uh, I've always thought that that time lag could be of help, that you could be 
working not just for today's audience, i.e. not just for today's overheated context, but for a different context also, uh, two years, three years, five years, 10 years from now. Uh, you know, even in my, uh, you know, talk, the, the family stories that I talk about, the stories we used to hear 15 years ago are not the stories we hear today because the, the stories remain the same, but the individuals have changed and what they want to highlight has completely changed. And I think sometimes working within the academy allows you to also have like a time span that can be useful. Um, the other thing which I think uh, touches a little bit on what Athar was also referencing about the question of safety and um, strictures, there's a way that I've, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say that the university is any kind of refuge because we know that universities are just as subject to many of the forces, uh, not only of censorship, but also of financial needs and capital and all of the things that that does. But still, in spite of that, I found the university context sometimes to be somewhere where you can have the conversations in a smaller setting first um, and not be plunged into the white heat of the national discussion going on, perhaps immediately. It's not always possible, of course, there, there are examples of books that then jump um, into national uh, debates. And sometimes they jump precisely because nobody's read the book, but they've read that one paragraph that somebody excerpted somewhere else. And that's, of course, a very common um, uh, issue. A colleague of uh, mine in Bangladesh, Shuti Sabur, who's a professor at Brack University, just wrote a essay for a German journal, uh, a special issue on 1971, and she has a specific thing about the Biharis of Saidpur, and then analysis of the state of nationalism within Shahbag today. And the, uh, a small paragraph from her thing is cited in a Facebook discussion and cited incorrectly. Um, so that's an example where you also can't really isolate it. And I think one of us actually then sent the URL to that discussion and said, oh, you should all read the whole article. But I know people aren't going to because that that little excerpt is all that they need to settle some sort of argument. So, so there's some possibility of working something out at a smaller scale away from the white heat of the nas national international debate. And then as the example I just gave, then they bleed into each other. So it's, it's a mixed um, situation. Um, yeah, there's some other thoughts, but I'll save it for maybe it'll come up in other points as well. But wish you over to you. Um, actually, both you and Athar have, uh, have said many of the things uh, that are there to say. So maybe we, we just move on to other questions. I'm in any case not an academic, so I can't respond to that question in terms of, you know, what academics can do. Um, but a little, I mean, at the ground level, because um, in some ways the framing of this discussion is also about justice. And uh, the question of justice comes up very strongly for when you're talking about disappearances. I think in some ways at a personal level, uh, the solidarities that we can build with survivors or people who are left behind uh, with unanswered questions about their loved ones who have disappeared is to do actually what I was mentioning, which is really to work towards validating that feeling that loss by listening to what they're saying. Because one thing is the, the disappearance and the unresolved questions, but other, the other thing is also the sense that nobody's, nobody's sort of, you know, even taking that loss for this grievous loss that it is, nobody's listening to you. People are just being indifferent and just passing you by and thinking, oh, this person is just howling about this or that or the other. So even just the act of being there, lending an ear, um, listening and validating and acknowledging, I think that helps in the healing or dealing with it. I, I know I hesitate to say these words because it sounds all very romantic, um, but I don't want it to sound like that because it is actually very political. So I'll stop there and see what other questions are. But actually, Urvashi, there are two questions that I feel like are starting to actually ask some of the um, sort of thing, uh, healing and listening possibilities that you were just addressing. Uh, and I'm just going to read them out loud, both of them. Um, so Usha Iyer says, much gratitude to the panel for these searing, moving presentations. I was struck by the presence of family and friendships in each of your accounts and the role of narrativizing history through storytelling, poetry, WhatsApp ma messages, and the like. It would be great to hear further thoughts about what different interconnected stories we tell when we think of South Asia, when we think South Asia as a region and decenter the nation state, especially India with its geopolitical hegemony in the region. 
When we think through the spectral, the ghostly resonances of the past and our kinship and storytelling structures, uh, Kisa Dastans routinely employ shape-shifting characters, for example, do we produce new paradigms of think thinking through the category of region rather than the nation? And then um, Prabhjot specifically um, uh, asked you, Urvashi, but I, again, I think this can be expanded in, uh, to think of different um, solidarities and friendships. Um, in an in era of increased censorship and severe reprisal, how does the act of listening and lis uh, speaking and listening continue and how can it be sustained? I loved your reference to and sharing sto of stories of friendship. When the in-depth listening is disrupted, how do we find avenues of female bonding? And I guess I would actually extend this to queer bonding and just bonding across nations um, in different ways. Urvashi, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm muted. Um, There's good dis Zoom discipline that we have been taught to mute yourself when you're not speaking, but then you forget to unmute yourself. Um, at some level, I mean, I see what you're saying uh, about the act of listening and the kind of repression through censorship and so on. So how do you actually hold on to that? But at some level, I think that it is such an intimate and personal act that it almost passes under the, under the radar sometimes uh, and is not picked up or noticed that much by the censors. Uh, the issues, of course, begin when you then take that and represent it or write about it or put it into the public domain. And then of course you have to be so careful about whether or not or how you might make the person talking to you vulnerable. And um, there is a whole question of ethics that applies over there that applies to any of these relationships where you are talking to people who have lived through traumatic moments and who trust you with that knowledge because uh, you not only have to think about the kind of censorship that may happen on you as researchers or as you as a project holder or something but also how uh, those people themselves might become vulnerable and there you have to choose then what to reveal and what not to reveal which is a very very tough choice but I think also, um, you know, there are ways and ways now uh, people are finding ever more imaginative ways of talking about those things. And say um, art, music, these are all um, ways in which you can bring in really difficult subjects. I mean, how, uh, if you listen, I've just been listening to music from the Northeast of India, you know, and all of those singers uh, and many of them women are bringing in church music to um, put out very, very strong political messages. And it kind of passes cover under that, but it gets out and there's a lot of resonance. So I suppose we have to think along these lines, how we can get out our words, what we want to say um, and how we can escape the censors. They will catch up with us someday, but maybe we'll have said a lot by then. And perhaps find new ways to say that they will not. Yeah, find new ways to say. Um, I'm sorry, that question about, um, about bonding and um, uh, friendships, uh, I think, I mean, I can come back to it. Would Naeem and uh, Atar like to talk a little about that? I don't want to hog the... Um, Mike, so. After. Well, I could, talk, I could talk a little bit about listening and also friendships. I mean, uh, when I, uh, I worked with the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons, and this is a female run organization, mostly Kashmiri women, Muslim women who are, who found, co-founded it and are leading it. Uh, so there is, there is a lot of that, the bonding and the, the sustenance of this very movement in face of this brutal military occupation. And I, I mean, I've seen that I've witnessed that and I do really have a lot of respect and I know that uh, it will go a long way in telling the story of Kashmir. But at the same time, I am also thinking about like what kind of listening, uh, you know, that is like, I know that listening has a certain connotation, but also let's say that the women of the APDP and the activists they've really talked about their story to a lot of women uh, and especially like many feminist solidarities in India as well who come and talk to them. 
So I have this, uh, I, I, my mind goes back to thinking about, I think it was in 2011 or 2012, IBN, CNN IBN, they nominated Parvina Ahangar, who is the leader of the movement. They nominated her as Shining India or something like that. And then she denounced that nomination. She turned it down and she's like, here I am uh, trying to uh, fight the Indian government. And she, they also don't really talk about their politics in that manner. They, they really uh, have to go under the radar and not confront Indian state in the same manner as uh, any other political movement might do because then they will get shut down. So they kind of skirt around it. So when she was nominated, she wrote a very strong, um, of course, like she had people helped her uh, form that uh, response, but she uh, in English, but she in Urdu and Kashmiri, she was very vocal about that nomination. So in a way, you know, sometimes these listening processes, they also kind of become, uh, they, they become problematic. Like in that sense, like if we take one thread of listening, uh, she the, this, this movement was kind of uh, a scene, it was heard, but then it was used in the wrong manner. So that deployment, like where are you using this listening and how it's being deployed? I understand in the networks and solidarity, feminist solidarities that are created, but I'm also worried about, um, and I'm, I'm really thinking about this these, these days because as a Kashmiri, I feel like uh, there is a lot of things that we've talked about in terms of Kashmir. We know what's happening, but what now? So I'm thinking about solidarity a lot in the last two years and how do we, how do we uh, really think about solidarities that can become tangibly useful for Kashmiris? And in that, one of the things, uh, this idea of selected ignorance, which is Gayatri Svivak's term, but she uses in terms of white imperialism, uh, having the selected ignorance about the uh, or subaltern or brown demographic or whatever you want to call it. But I feel like in Kashmir, uh, in context of Kashmir, that selected ignorance is happening a lot and has happened a lot in the last 30 years and 72 years as well, uh, which is not to really know what's Kashmir about and just think in both the countries, so to speak, there is this element of possession as you are talking about the elder siblings earlier. So there's this elder sibling and then there is a super elder sibling uh, for Kashmiris. And, uh, and that, that's where the listening becomes problematic for Kashmiris. There are, there's a select group of people who are really listening to Kashmiris, who are coming to Kashmir, listening to Kashmiri stories. But then what, what happens? Like Parveena gets a no nomination for CNN and IBN. And then also the movement gets really, really uh, convolutedly uh, manifests in different literature across. Um, so that's also a problem, like, you know, what kind of listening, what, what does listening do and who is using and who is your audience at that particular moment and who's lending you an air, what are they doing with the information? So, um, and, I, and for me, it becomes important because it's also a question of solidarity and what, when, what kind of solidarity are we trying to seek? I mean, when we think about human rights violations, there's a lot of solidarities that, that Kashmiris come across. But the moment we say that human rights violations is just a manifestation, there is a problem here. Most of the solidarity and most of the listening goes away because uh, then no one wants to touch it because it's a political dispute and that's problematic. And that's where uh, many, many uh, you know, people who might have lent solidarity that we are going to do away with AFSPA, which is the draconian law and all of that, uh, but they don't want, they want Kashmir to integrate with India. That is their firm belief. And so that, that does happen, uh, that happens across LOC as well. Um, so that's where I will end. But so m I'm kind of like trying to be cautious about, uh, I am all for listening. And, but I also feel that we are at a stage, especially when we think about Kashmir, like what does it do for the solidarity and what kind of listening are we uh, speaking to, so to speak? Aziz, I maybe just wanted to say something quickly about the idea of kinship and friendship that has come up in more than one person's comment. Just from a personal experience, I know that uh, not only the friendships, but the alliances and even the encounters where how I first encountered a jarring disconnect between national narratives that we have been raised with uh, and that are continuously further cemented by narratives in books and films and national pronouncements and the actual experiences of, you know, the other two parts of what I would say is Midnight's Triangle. Um, you know, I, I didn't actually encounter Indians and Pakistanis in real life outside of the myth, 
uh, that you grow up with um, until I came to the United States for college. Um, and this is in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, the Pakistani students broadly didn't actually know anything about 1971. So it isn't that they resisted. It's just that they didn't know. So you'd start from this expectation of personal conflict on campus and find that they would just look at you with befuddlement. This is in the early 90s. Um, and then I remember there's one Pakistani student, I've never been able to find him since, um, Chris Coelho, who is uh, obviously um, of Christian origin, but he's the nephew, I think, of Anthony Mascarenhas, who famously was the Pakistani journalist who first broke the story. Tony Mascarenhas himself is an outsider, of course, within the Pakistan project in all sorts of ways. And this was the one person, so the one minority within that group of Pakistani students who knew a lot about 1971, but from the family connection, oh, my uncle wrote about this and he wanted to know more. And then on the other side, the Indian students, when I first encountered them for the first time in my life, you know, were sort of befuddled by Bangladesh in its contemporary state because they had been raised with the stories, unlike the Pakistanis, because of course it's a story that they would want to hear. And that story is, you know, full on Indian triumph. And they would always wonder why Bangladesh wasn't more grateful. You know, that was like the narrative in their mind. And then everything that's happened since 71 that has soured the relationship. So, and, you know, then you're some, sort of navigating these things because you're on a university campus and there are 20, 25 of you on this American university campus and you're trying to be friends in this sort of, you know, the first time we started using this term South Asia, right, which people didn't necessarily want to use. Some people wanted to say subcontinent and then others would say, no, what subcontinent is related to Indian subcontinent. So the first time this literally is uh, when I was in my early twenties, you have to navigate the gap between the stories you've raised with and are loyal to and these other experiences, which you don't necessarily believe, but you're also starting to sort of come up against them. And that journey, I think, has continued for, you know, the rest of my life, basically. And so therefore, the kinships are the way that, you know, a lot of this work starts from there, right, from this jarring disconnect. Not that we agree, but we disagree, but then we start to figure out. And in our disagreement with somebody else, we also start disagreeing with the stories that we're inculcated with. And Aziz, can I add a uh, brief footnote, please? Sure. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh, just to that earlier question, and uh, I take all others' cautions on board. Uh, she's talking about the act of listening. But I wanted to come back to the question of building solidarity. So I think, you know, one of the things that I have learned in and uh, across South Asia in feminist movements, I think all of us have learned that the beginnings when we started by actually talking to each other, by listening, talking, and hearing about each other were very important beginnings because one of the things they showed us was we were not alone. You know, you were thinking that only you were the one feeling like this or only you were facing this. I mean, the Me Too movement has shown this across the world when women have started coming out one after the other. And the speaking out and the listening, what it helps to do is to create a sense of community to create a sense of belonging. And those are the communities that actually then build solidarities. And in recent years, this is what the internet with all the vile things that happen on it, this is what the internet has done for queer communities, for trans communities, for people who have been marginalized and who have not been able to speak out their feelings. It's given them a space to do that and to transcend the borders that have been created for us. So I think that that's something that we really need to also keep in mind. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for these um, answers. And actually there's so many questions coming up and actually we have to stop in 10 minutes. So I'm gonna try and kind of navigate because some of these questions have been kind of answered in different ways but I do wanna kind of try and bring as many voices in. Um, so um, An Anuba Anushri just asked actually about with the advent of social media, listening has been dispersed and fragmented, just as speaking has re rendered fractal. Um, so how do we see social movements respond to challenges and opportunities created by social media technologies? And I feel like Urvashi, you were kind of, I'm just trying to get some of these questions in and then we can open it up for discussion more um, uh, to everyone. Um, Shireen Ahmed um, asked something that I feel like name you were already starting to refer to. Um, which is these wounds are deep and perpetuated through generations and the four separations you have talked about. Do South Asians in the, in the US have a role to play in bringing us to come together and heal some of these wounds? Um, again, I'm throwing this question out that I feel like Naeem, you, you and Athar were addressing in different ways. Also the fact that both of you are in the US yeah, uh, right now. 
Um, and, uh, and then Nanika Mukherjee asks, um, again, thanks for these poignant presentations. And can she asks, can art enable the search for justice beyond the affective? How do you each reflect on this? So just wanted to kind of throw some of these questions out there together so that we can kind of, with the fact that we only have like 10 minutes and I know it's really late for you Urvashi now, almost 1 a.m. in India. So we could actually ask them in a way that is um, perhaps more woven in. Well, if I can come in uh, briefly, uh, I mean, Nayanika's, uh, to Nayanika's question, her own work uh, on Bangladesh has been uh, pretty amazing um, and we published it. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, say uh, really a one-liner because this is a big discussion. I think that um, in some ways when the hurt is so deep, questions of justice cannot be separated from the affective uh, because um, the sense of somehow um, receiving justice, I suppose that's the only thing that one can call it, um, has to be a deeply felt sense and that has to touch the emotions. That's really what I feel. I uh, will leave the other questions to the others uh, to answer. I have a six o'clock yoga class in the morning, but I'm not going away, I'm, I'll <laughs> stay to but I'd like to begin with, I, I think I've, I don't know what I'm answering here. I'm just kind of like speaking out loud now that Urushi has spoken and everyone else has asked questions. Well, I want to say that Urushi listened to me. She just published my book in India. <laughs> so that's one example. Wow. And it's a wonderful book and I'm so delighted to publish it. Thank you. And I think uh, you even published it before it was published. Uh, remember, you met, we met and you said, oh, your book is coming out. We are going to publish it. So, so I think uh, Urushi knows what feminist praxis is. And uh, we learn all the time. And I'm, I'm so happy that we have this solidarity. of. Uh, so I, I kind of think that uh, I wanted to speak to the question of art. Uh, I, I feel like art, everyone is searching for justice, but I think art can really and help us envision what justice would look like. And I think that's, I think that's the that's the basis of this conversation as well, just to see how we can tra traverse these um, boundaries in that sense. I, I really like when I think about Kashmir, I'm like, uh, do we really want to become a country, so to speak, the same country that India has become or Pakistan has become or thinking about the Israeli settler colonial state or even the US as a settler colonial state? What are the futures that we are looking towards? And then I think that, you know, as we are thinking about them, and this is this is my different hat. This is not the, the paper that the, the hat that was used when I was located in the paper that I read. But just thinking about the ecological disaster that we are all facing, I, I don't think that this, this conversation will remain controlled within we trying to think what kind of visions we have for nation states or peoples and all of that. I feel like the planet is going to take it away from our hands. That's my hope, really. That's my biggest hope. But I also know that uh, there is so much thinking done. You're thinking about tra transversal uh, solidarity that you Nira Yuval Davis talks about where we kind of think about our situated knowledges and then we are un a universal sisterhood or whatever hood you want to speak of but at the same time we are also thinking about that that the relativity might not be as much true so we have to stay rooted but we also have to reach out so I feel that that has happened in case of Kashmir a lot in the last two years the way we have received solidarity uh, from people like writing songs or writing poetry or you know writing stories or just listening to our stories and I think I completely agree Urvashi there is no we're on the same page that stories can be healing and it begins from there I think my uh, earlier the, the, the thing that I was talking about the my insights were connected to because you know Talking about Kashmir, I also think um, they, uh, I'm pushed into the corner sometimes and it's almost like, what do I do next? Because <clears throat> I'm not at, just speaking to the academia, but I'm also speaking to the people and people who have expectations from me. And then it becomes like, what, what do I do with this? So, um, so I agree, I think uh, art is important and I think art is going to lead the way. And, and we just have to envision what kind of justice are we looking towards? and also smashing these patriarch patriarchal nation states. I feel we have to 
think beyond them and keep thinking beyond them. It might not be in our generation, but the planet and that thinking together is going to probably, probably create a better future. Uh, just very quickly connecting the comment about, I would say not the US, but roles of um, South Asians who are maybe somewhere in the diaspora, whether temporarily or permanently. And then the question about uh, the role of an aesthetic project uh, and art spaces. Uh, I mean, for myself, you know, my work over the last 10, 15 years has focused on the parts that don't fit the nas standard national narrative uh, for Bangladesh. And part of the national narrative is based on uh, focusing only on ourselves as victims, uh, primarily of 1971 and uh, 1947 actually disappears from that narrative. Uh, and I've been interested along with others of talking about all the other complications in this story, um, including, you know, um, to borrow from Amun Mandani's book titles, when victims can also become killers. Uh, and even on this uh, 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 talk, you know, we have Nainika Mukherjee's book that talks about the complications of the narrative. And I've noticed that in the participants is uh, Dina Siddiqui, who's done work um, on Biharis in Bangladesh. Um, I already mentioned Shuti Sobur and her work about the Biharis of Saidpur. And then I also noticed that Hana Shams Ahmed, who is uh, who has been doing long-term research on the Adivasi of uh, the Chittagong Hill tracks, you know, which elsewhere I've referred to as our own private Palestine, where we've replicated the, uh, the, the role of 1971 is re replicated now by uh, our own state. So I've, I and others have been interested in also jarring that national narrative and that certainty, uh, and also that one direction of the flow that we're just receiving violence and also never dispensing it. And for that, I found both the deterritorialized situation, whether temporary or not, to be sometimes helpful to have a narrative that takes in all three nations together um, in conversation. And then also within the visual arts, I found it to be a space where you can start the story and not necessarily have to finish it because when you're finishing it in the essay form, um, even no matter how much ambiguity you build into your essay, there is a way that people take the essay from beginning to end to arrive at a conclusion. Uh, and I found that some things can be instrumentalized by the state, even if that's not your objective. I just mentioned about Suthi Sobur's essay being misquoted and miscited already in a social media debate. So that's not even something that she as an academic can necessarily control. Of course, that's not to say that something from visual arts can't be as well, but I feel like having more ambiguity in the entire terrain of storytelling helps to keep it, helps to argue for a more open-ended approach to this history. Aziz, will you allow me to come in with one remark? Yeah. I'm so sorry, just, um, I just want to go back to, uh, I mean, to refer to what Naeem is also saying, but go back to the question about justice and affect. And I want to tell you a story since I, that's what I like to do from Nagaland, where um, there was a young woman called Leung Emla, who was killed by the, uh, raped and killed by the army. And while the search for justice goes on in formal terms, that is through the case, et cetera, that has been filed, her friends and sisters and other women got together and one of them, a designer, created a piece of clothing, which is called a kashan. It's the kind of sarong that Naga women wear, the lower garment, uh, which they wear. And she created this and she wove into the design what they saw as the story of this young woman. So the design has uh, motifs which look or which symbolize the fact of when a, the woman is being sexually attacked, she first reaction is to cross her fingers over her chest, cross her hands over her chest. So you see these amazing crosses made in different ways. And there is a line that goes through it, which is a straight line. But when you wear it, the line becomes wavy up, down, sideways, etc., And that symbolizes the difficult and never linear search for justice. And every woman who wears this remembers this young woman and her story. And of course, it is not justice for what happened to her. But yes, in some ways, it is a very, very important tribute and answers to that question about affect and how important that is. Thank you so much, Urvashi, um, for this final comment that and story, which I think actually is the perfect ending note for us. And I know we have other questions, but we are at 11 and it's been, you know, really, I think, poignant, moving, intense two hours. Thank you so much to the panelists. Um, and thanks again to Lalita and Stanford Center for South Asia, Simrath, for this invitation. 
um, to organize. And thank you all for joining us, especially those in like Europe and South Asia, where I know it's after like 10 p.m. or after midnight, depending on where you are. Um, and Lalitha, I don't, I think you wanted to say maybe some closing words or anything. I just want to once again, on behalf of everyone in the center, our director, Professor, Professor Jishin Menon, who is teaching right now, uh, to thank all of you, but also to thank you, Aziz. You really masterminded this. You pulled it together. I know you went through incredible lengths uh, and did an enormous amount of emotional labor to make this happen. And I appreciate it so much. But I also want to echo your thanks of the person who has not been on screen uh, all morning, Simrat Mataru, who is just the, the behind the scenes work of an event like this. Uh, is amazing, incredible, and she has done it all. So thank you to her. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to Pankaj's internet, Urvashi. Please pass on our gratitude <laughs> that he forgot to turn his internet off. That's <laughs> and that really worked out in our favor. Uh, I'm just going to end with a slide. Um, one of our future events uh, has been confirmed with Professor Nayani Kamukoji. So I'm just going to share my screen so people can see thank that. Thank you. From and thank you all. Really fantastic. Thank you.